series. Now, the message today is called Jesus is the Way from Matthew 1, verse 18. It's a Christmas series, but it's a series that we're calling All About Jesus because, you know, that is the heart, surely, of Christmas. So let's look at our reading together. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And you can tell the way that is phrased, that's, that's, not, a good, that's not a good feeling we get from that. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, Do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son and you are to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. That's a verse that I've really focused on during our Christmas mission. Then verse 22, all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife. Thank the Lord for the transformation that took place in Joseph's heart there. But he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. What a beautiful reading, and all God's people said... Amen. So Jesus is the way. I mean, if you're a follower of Jesus, what can be controversial or difficult about that? You may say, well, pastor, I already know that Jesus is the way. But hold on, let me just really emphasize some some things here today because many evidently in this world do not believe that Jesus is the way. In fact, probably for the vast majority of the, the world and certainly the secular viewpoint, the idea that Jesus is the way and that Jesus is the only way in Christ alone. My hope is found on Christ, the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. That idea is offensive to most people in the world. And it's certainly not a neat fit with pluralism. Pluralism is probably the dominant teaching method in this world of how we understand religions. And the idea of pluralism or manyism is that there are many ways and there's not one way. And if anyone claims one way, that's obviously an offensive thing. And so I grew up with that at school as well, comparative religion, where essentially I was taught, and by the way, I didn't believe it, but I was taught that um, there are many ways and uh, religion is basically the same. And so, so we were taught different religions, and even though we discovered that the religions are very different, we were nonetheless taught by the secular mindset that all religions are the same, even though all religions are spectacularly different. But that's the secular mindset that it says there's the secular that is the pure and the rational and the, and the right and the righteous. And then there is the foolish religious lump over here. And let's put them all together in one piece and call it pluralism and say there are many ways. Um, I would just say that's um, not a wise or healthy or accurate understanding of reality. Um, and so uh, I heard it said the opposite to b- believing is not believing nothing but believing everything. And that's what so many in our world want to do. And so the idea of Jesus being the only way right from the beginning is a challenging truth to believe. But I'm telling you, friends, all followers of Jesus need to believe this, that he is the way and the truth and the life, or uh, we, we don't know the Lord. Uh, to know the Lord is to believe that Jesus is the way. Now, a lot of things get, get said these days. Uh, that I think one of my least favorite phrases right now is, my truth. My truth. And that's part of pluralism that says, uh, if you have a particular worldview, that's your truth, that's your truth, and it doesn't really matter what your truth is. Um, The world wants us to say that Jesus is just a way, and that's my truth. The Bible tells us that Jesus is the truth, and we're coming to that. We're coming to see that it's in Christ alone. So last week, we emphasized through the Christmas story... uh, declared to us, especially through the prophet Isaiah, that Jesus is prophesied and Jesus is pre-existing. And Jesus is very kind, a bruised reed he will not break. This week we're focusing on the way, and next week we're going to look at the fact that Jesus Christ reigns forever. But I've got two questions about Jesus being the way. Here's the first question. Well, who needs to be saved from their sins? 
Clearly, there's a strong phrase here in Matthew chapter 1. I've been preaching it all week. And that is, he will save his people from their sins. But here's my question. Who needs to be saved from their sins? Is it every person on earth or is it just some people that have a particular conviction about their sin? To many, the idea of being saved is ridiculous. They don't believe that anybody is lost, except perhaps for the very worst people in this world like Adolf Hitler and Chairman Mao. Uh, Where I come from, people used to joke about Jesus saves, and they would say, well, Jesus saves, Moses invests, and they would kind of laugh it off. Uh, But I say to you, my friends, even the Christmas story has serious undertones to it that we need to be saved from our sins. Let me just give you an idea of um, some of the Christmas songs from On from O Holy Night. Long lay the world in sin and error, pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. That's a powerful image, isn't it, of a world in serious trouble. From O Little Town of Bethlehem. Actually, one of my friends in Wales has just recorded O Little Town. He's called Mal Pope, and uh, he's doing a fundraiser. And he got Catherine Zeta-Jones and Martin Sheen and Bonnie Tyler and lots of celebrities to get involved in this. I was blown away by this. But um, there's a very powerful verse in O Little Town of Bethlehem, one of my favorite Christmas hymns. How silently, how silently the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts... To human hearts, the blessings of his heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him, still the dear Christ enters in. And so a little town has that real sense of this is a world of sin. And think about that wonderful American uh, Christmas song, Mary, did you know? Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? It's wrapped up in the heart of the Christmas message. He will save his people from their sins. And so my question is, who needs to be saved from their sins? Are there any exceptions? And do we sometimes make ourselves the exceptions? I'm telling you, one of the most dangerous positions to be in either is to be a church person and to feel like we've long since repented of our sins and we've got no more sins to deal with. But I'm telling you, even church folks need an intercessor. The worst position of all is the Pharisee position who says all those people over there need to repent of our sins, but we're already perfect. You can be a secular Pharisee. You can be a religious Pharisee. But I suggest to you it's a very dangerous place to think that we don't need to be saved. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It keeps fascinating me that this world has become very judgmental. Uh, that there seems to be a strong condemnation of other people. And I wonder if at the heart of this is a failure to understand that I need a savior. I need an intercessor. And if I have been saved, I need to stay close to Jesus. And he's going to keep me by his power. He's going to keep me to the end. But I need to stay close to Jesus. I always need an intercessor. I wonder if not believing that I'm a sinner is one of the most dangerous things in this world that will lead us ultimately to creating our own self-righteous worldview, and then that gives us freedom to condemn others. If I'm a sinner, how can I condemn anyone else? If I've sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, how can I look at my fellow man and think less of them? Perhaps our judgmentalism does hint at the fact that there must be a right and a wrong. The problem is when we invent our own sense of right and wrong, Yes, there is a sense of right and wrong. Where do we get it from? We get it from God himself. So I just want to talk a little bit more about who needs to be saved and what sin actually is. Let me just describe sin. First of all, one of the the frequently used words for sin in the New Testament is missing the mark. Missing the mark. And so, yeah, you can think about uh, missing a target. And uh, there, there it is. In this picture, it hit the target. But I think you and I know that there's a certain aim, there's a certain direction that we should head in, and sometimes we just miss the mark. And one of my favorite illustrations of this is in the original Robin Hood, a Prince of Thieves, and um, Robin Hood's about to uh, take a shot uh, at the target, and Maid Marian kind of blows in his ear, to sort of, and he suddenly misses the target. He got distracted for whatever reason. We sometimes just miss the target. We miss righteousness. Another famous word uh, for sin is trespass. Of course, it's there in the Lord's 
prayer. And the idea is, of course, no trespassing. We should not, we should not go there. Don't go there. And don't go there. And the word fences in uh, some of the places that we're allowed to go and some of the places we're not allowed to go with regard to certain aspects of human behavior. The Old Testament law gives us wonderful guidance to say, I wouldn't even go in that direction whatsoever. And like uh, in Leviticus chapter 18, on six occasions, the Lord signs his name to it. It's almost like no trespassing, signed the Lord God. It's like you're not allowed to go there, trespassing. And that's why we pray, forgive us our trespasses or forgive us our sins as we forgive those that have trespassed against us. And that's another sin to not forgive. How about sins of omission? Who needs to be saved? Well, anyone who's committed a sin of omission, those are those things that we leave undone. And if we're following Jesus right now, this is going to help us in our discipleship to even now consider those sins of omission. We, we've been saved, but in our discipleship, in our walk with the Lord, we want to make sure that we don't miss the mark, that we don't trespass, that we don't miss the things that God wants us to do. Prayerlessness can be a sin. Uh, it can be a sin to neglect worship. That's certainly true from the commandments of God. How about not coming to someone's assistance? Now, I know sometimes we have difficult decisions to make about helping others. There's always an appeal. There's always a need. There's always someone in front of us. Uh, I'm not saying that it's a sin of omission to ignore that internet appeal that seems a bit dodgy that comes into your email from someone you've never heard of. I don't believe that's necessarily a sin of omission at all. In fact, it may be wisdom not to follow through on that one. There can be a false guilt, but a true guilt is when the Word and the Holy Spirit show us that we need to do something and we didn't do it. And it may be that our heart was not compassionate. It may be that we didn't listen to our conscience. Sometimes it may even be that a minister or a volunteer just asked us to help out and there was just something within us that said no. And that might have been right, right to say no, but it equally may have been resisting the Holy Spirit because that was a call of God to participate in. And then there are sins of commission. So if the sins of omission are not doing the things we should do, the sins of commission are doing the things uh, that we shouldn't have done. A good example of a sin of omission is when Joseph was left in prison probably for a few extra years because the cupbearer to the king did not speak up in Joseph's defense. And years later, the, uh, the cupbearer um, suddenly saw an opportunity to help Joseph when he realized that to help Joseph it would help himself to tell the king about a man who could interpret dreams in the prison. And then the cupbearer said, Today... I'm reminded of my shortcomings. I pray that a little part of this message today, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and I and go, Ooh, I'm reminded of my shortcomings today. Those are sins of omission, the sins of commission. If the sin of omission in the cupbearer's case was not to speak up, the sin of commission is sometimes when we speak up when we shouldn't. When the Lord says to us by the Holy Spirit, don't say that, don't open that door, don't start that subject, don't open that tab, don't go to that screen, don't talk to that person, don't say that thing. When the Holy Spirit warns us or when the scriptures warn us not to do that stuff and when we do that, that's a sin of commission. There's something deliberate and there's real danger in neglecting the Holy Spirit. Don't type that thing, don't go to that person, don't make that call and we hear that Warning, and we do it, and sometimes we bear consequences and pain for missing the mark, for trespassing, for omitting that thing, for that sin of commission. There are sometimes consequences that go with that. Now, I pray that as we walk with the Lord with regard to sinfulness, that when that sin is revealed in our own heart and we see it, that we confess it quickly. And we don't beat ourselves up, but we come before him and say, God, I'm sorry. You know, very often I turn to Psalm 51. When I realize that I've said or done something that displeases the Lord, I go to Psalm 51 and I try to dive into that psalm and, and say, Lord, I'm sorry. But you know something? He, he, he forgives us and he, he wants to, to grow us. And so we don't stay wallowing for a long, long time. You know, Proverbs 7 warns us against the sin of adultery. I felt the Lord just prompt me to share this in this message today. Uh, Proverbs asks the question, can a man scoop fire into his lap without his clothes being burned? 
It's a really challenging passage of Scripture. If anyone's just uh, flying too close to the sun with regard to sexual morality right now, I plead with you to read uh, Proverbs chapter 7. And what I'm saying is now contrary to what the Pope said this week when he said he didn't believe that sexual sins of the the flesh were so important or ruinous, I heard another preacher say, a Protestant preacher say, that sexual sins can ruin you. And I believe that that teacher is far closer to the truth and far closer to the scriptures. God can forgive all sin. With regard to consequences, sexual sin can ruin many lives. Usually, eventually, it all sneaks out and all is known. Uh, But it also, here's the other thing, it ruins us. And if it hasn't sneaked, the word hasn't sneaked out yet, and we haven't faced the consequences yet, the consequences are internal, and it begins to take all the energy and life from our soul. By the way, you cannot lust and worship at the same time. By the way, you can't be angry, you can't be mad and worship at the same time either. That's why when we come to worship, the Lord's word to us is, when you're about to worship and you realize you can't worship, there's something between you and God. It may be an immorality, it may be anger. You've got to sort that out quickly. And don't let it keep you from worship. Sort it out and then come and worship. And so you can see that sin is a big deal. Who needs to be saved? Well, everybody. Who has sinned? Well, clearly, even the list that we've been going through, everybody. Just go through the Ten Commandments and you'll realize in some form or fashion, just about every one of us has broken just about every one of those sins. And when we look at the New Testament application, the exposition of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says... Um, I'm telling you, uh, I I believe in the Old Testament law. You've heard it said, do not murder. But I say to you, don't even be angry with that brother. You see that in heart and in spirit, all of us have broken God's law. And it's no surprise that the scripture says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So are there many ways? Is there just no way? The Bible says Jesus is the way. He will save his people from their sins. The reason he's come to save his people from their sins is that people need to be saved from their sins. And that's absolutely everybody. If you're listening to this message, you know I've been kind of relentlessly a little bit piling it on in one sense to really emphasize the point of Christmas is not that we just get to have a nice winter festival. The point of Christmas is not just kind of a nice gooey feeling, but the point of Christmas is that we're in trouble. If we were to describe this world today, surely you would say it's a shipwreck. It's a catastrophe. We're in, the, the ship is leaning at 30 degrees and it's getting worse. We're about to capsize. And so just at the right time, God sent his son. Why? Because God so loved the world. So I'm going to encourage you to believe that you and I have sinned. And Joseph's biggest danger, as we look at this passage of Scripture together, Joseph's biggest danger was to not believe in the Messiah. Joseph was faithful to the law. It means he was a good guy. He was a church man. He was one of the best. People looked up to him, and he didn't want to expose his wife to public disgrace. He had a good heart, but he was bound by the law, and he had in mind something that was a terrible thought. He was going to divorce the Virgin Mary. He was going to have wrong thoughts, uh, condemning thoughts towards a very good person who was actually with child by the Holy Spirit. So can you see the danger of the Pharisee? The danger even of the righteous person is that we don't realize our great need of a savior. And it was not till Joseph is persuaded that God has come. It's not till the angel gives him the message and then he wakes up and now he does the right thing and he goes to be with Mary and to marry her. It's not till then that Joseph, in a sense, is truly right with God as well. He was in real danger in his very self-righteous way of turning away from the things of God. Who can be saved? Who needs to be saved? Well, when the seed was cast, some fell on hard ground. Some fell on the path. Some would get suffocated by thorns. And that's a reality of gospel proclamation that we've been doing this week. We trust that. We want everyone to be saved. And God wants everyone to be saved. And yet we know that the reality is that there are many that just push it away. And Maybe for some it's going to take some time. Uh, but not everyone does respond, though everyone is invited Somehow, not everyone is chosen. Not everyone is responding. Nonetheless, we preach the message that God wants all to be saved. And so, who needs to be saved? Everybody needs to be saved. And we pray that as many as possible can hear the gospel call today. Second question is, who can save? 
Are there many ways? Uh, are, there, are there many saviors? Uh, are there many different paths? Who can be saved? Well, verse 21 says, She will give birth to a son. You're to give him the name Jesus because he will save his people from their sins. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. Can I say this, friends? God alone can save. I cannot save myself. I don't have the power to do that. No one, even though all the world needs to be saved, none of the world know how to be saved without the help of God. Salvation is entirely of the Lord. And salvation comes from God. Salvation comes because the Father sends the Son into the world in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so he is conceived by the Holy Spirit. God and sinners reconciled. But let me tell you, God and sinners are not reconciled just because Jesus was sent into the world. God and sinners are reconciled when sinners recognize the need to be saved, that we have sinned, that we're convicted of our sin, and that only Christ can save us. Um, there are a lot of life situations when we receive someone's help when we're in physical danger. Uh, I talked to a friend of mine in Wales the other day. Uh, he's actually by the name of Samson. Isn't that a great name? He plays rugby for Wales, played about 40-odd times for Wales. And uh, I was asking him how his boat was. I said, uh, Samson, how's your boat? And he said, you know, uh, I got in trouble. I got rid of the boat. I said, what happened? He said, uh, I got in trouble 50 miles out to sea. I said, how did he get home? He said, the lifeboat. The lifeboat came and, and helped Samson. Isn't that a great story? Um, but you know, whether it's a lifeboat, whether it's an ambulance, whether we're airlifted or it's a doctor or a police officer, in one sense, there are some situations in which we need to be rescued or saved. We call upon their help or someone calls upon their help on our behalf and in our desperation, someone comes and intervenes for us and we're so thankful for those that put themselves in physical danger. That's in the physical sense. In the spiritual sense, no other man can help me except God. Now people can point us in the right direction, like even John the Baptist. John the Baptist did not come to be the Savior, but John the Baptist came to point to the Savior. Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Or behold, gaze upon the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. We help one another when we don't point each other to each other, but we help one another spiritually when we point one another to Jesus Christ. I've heard some people say, I was saved at the Billy Graham rally, but let me tell you, Billy Graham didn't save you. Jesus saved you. Uh, he is the way. He is the only way. How can we be saved? It has to be God. And it has to be God's Son, Savior. God with us, born of a virgin, who fulfilled everything that he was sent to do. The sinless one. And so I'm going to close with some scriptures that really drive home to us our need to be saved and our need to cling to Christ alone and that there's no other way. You may say, Pastor, I already know that. That's great. Let this be affirmed. Let it go deep down into the core of your being. If you don't believe that, I encourage you, believe that Christ is the only way because that is the truth more than anything that the world will pull at and that the devil will try to undermine. If you believe that there are other ways, your faith is sunk. But if you believe that Christ is the only way God made man, then I tell you, friends, that changes everything. So listen to these scriptures. Hebrews 4.15 For we do not have a high priest, this is Jesus, who is unable to empathize with our weakness. Let me pause there and say, what a kind Savior. What a good Savior who came into our world and lived our life and even died death for us. He's not unable to empathize with our weakness, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. We've been tempted in every way and sinned, yet Jesus comes as a sinless sacrifice. He never sinned. It's only God that can save. All other religious leaders have sinned except Jesus. 1 Timothy 2, 3 says this. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And yet there's a beautiful balance to this as well from verse 5. For there is one God. He wants all to be saved, but there's only one way to be saved. There is one God and one mediator between God and mankind. The man, Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. It's only Jesus. The most famous Bible verse of all. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one 
And Jesus is the only way. There's no other way. He's the one and only Son, the only begotten, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. He will save his people from their sins. And that same scripture has one more verse, or the next verse. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. God is not mean. We stand condemned already. We, we've sinned. Uh, we've messed up. Uh, the whole world is creaking and kind of falling over. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Because they, they do not believe in the name of God's one and only Son. And so could it be that the worst sin, the most dangerous sin of all is to not believe in Jesus Christ. And to reject God's rescue. To reject God's help. Thank the Lord that Joseph was spoken to in a dream that he could, right at that point, accept Christ as his Savior as well. And John 14, 6, I've said it a number of times over. Jesus said, I am the way. Anybody still arguing? Saying that there are many ways. This is, this is your truth. No, this is the truth. I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Can there be any doubt about this entire verse, yet all the other words of Scripture back it up. No one, no one comes to the, well, I can, my truth. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts 4.12, this is not on the screen, but I must declare it. Salvation is found in no one else. If all of us listening in today can believe that we all need to be saved, who needs to be saved? Me, I need to be saved. And we can all believe that Jesus is the only way. That's a an explosive, transformative worldview that helps me see the world and everything I do in a different way. Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. And so on this day, we bring our gifts to a church with all our failings and fallings and struggles during these last couple of years. But we, we are a church that believes in the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. We believe in his word, and we believe his word is true, and we believe that Jesus is the only way. So everything we do as a church is to glorify God and to see that transformation that Jesus Christ brings into our lives, to revive his people. And so we pray for our children's ministries and our student ministry, all our ministry to our adults, everything we do internally as a church to care for one another in fellowship, everything we do outwardly in the community and into world mission. It's for the name of Jesus Christ who is the only way. And so I'm thankful that Joseph woke up and he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him. So may you and I, because Jesus is the only way, also wake up, believe this truth and share it with the world. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you on this special weekend and at this Christmas season. We thank you that in this world of sin, in this world of strife, with all the troubles that there are in this world today. We thank you that the Christmas story and all the Christmas hymnody recognizes uh, this world of sin. We pray that meek souls, meek souls will receive him still. And may the dear Christ enter in, grant us faith to believe that Jesus is the way and that all of us sinners must put our trust in you our Savior and our intercessor and all God's people said, Amen.